Uh, hi, my name is Vinod Kaul and I work for Intel Corporation. Uh, I do a bunch of audio drivers for audio DSPs for Intel and uh, today we are going to talk about ASOC topology. This is the kind of work which we did uh, as part of Intel DSPs uh, for latest Skylake and beyond processors. So a bit of history before we go started with this. Uh, so this ASOC topology is not a new concept, it was actually a couple like uh, three or four years back. Uh, credits go to Liam Girdwood. He started writing this when he was working for TI back in the OMAP days. And uh, in that, what we did is basically have a simple uh, DAPM description for a DSP. And that DAPM description was essentially coded up in the user space and sent down to the kernel so that drivers can load this description. Uh, in this case, uh, once we started upstreaming it, it uh, is actually not so nice to uh, have the DAPM description in the user space because that essentially exposes all the DAPM details to uh, internal details to user mode. So that's when uh, in Liam came to Intel and we started relooking at this and uh, started cleaning it up a bit and started upstreaming. So initial version of the patches were accepted in version 4.2 and eventually uh, other features made it into the main line and uh, ABI is now deemed stable from 4.9 onwards. Uh, the subsequent AlsaLib support was made available in 1.1.0 version of the Alsa library. So why do we need the ASOC topology or why do we need the topology description in the user space? So assuming a simple DSP graph like this one in the picture here, we can have a DSP which probably has two PCMs and two I2S endpoints and between them you can have modules doing the audio processing like say in this example AB and CD doing the front end audio processing and then on the back end you do the post processing in ENF modules. Now since it's a DSP what we get from customers and vendors is oh you know this is nice but I would like to do something else something like this where I replace some of the modules in your system by my own modules or by a third party module so which is kind of okay so I would have initially coded all this particular uh, description in the driver uh, and then when I get the request I would change that description modify it put these two new modules inside now uh, in a kernel, if you do that, probably you will probably do a uh, build flag or a module uh, parameter to differentiate between these two graphs. Uh, so you're happy, you deliver the patches, you probably upstream them and everybody's happy. Then another customer comes and says, can I do this? I don't want this module, I don't want two PC backends, I want only one PCM backend and I want instead of your modules, I want some other module called Z. So you go back to the drawing board and say, oh, how do I figure things out and try to uh, change the description again. And so you do that, another guy comes and says, you know what, I need a third PCM, probably I want to do a low latency or a deep buffer application. Can you do that for me? So this kind of uh, cycle happens endlessly that you keep on getting requests from customers and uh, uh, you have to uh, continuously modify your graph description because it's a DSP here. Everybody puts DSP for scalability and flexibility purposes and if you're not able to customize it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. So that is when we started looking at ASOC topology. Liam was working in TI and then we started collaborating and then he came over back to Intel. And that is when we started re-looking at it, how do you want to do things? So the way we have done this now is, we have a simple description uh, in user space. We call that a, a topology configuration. Then we have some tools which can build that configuration into a binary description. Uh, we call it topology.binary. And that binary we pass on to the kernel. So kernel loads that binary description and then creates the whole DAPM graph and widgets and associated elements for it. So now, we, as we say in the problem, we had a problem of being able to customize, not able to customize for the customers. Now, instead of having module flags, build flags, or all sorts of things, we can just simply provide a different configuration file to different customers. They can build it for their own and use that and load it in their own systems. So this way, we solve the problem of configuring the system, scalability, and changing the graph per user or per vendor for us. So how do we do this? Okay, 
Uh, as I said, we described the topology in the configuration file. This is called topology.conf. You can see the sample configuration files in the Alsa library right now. Uh, from Since we are using it in the user space, we need uh, user space tools and utilities. For this, we have our own good old Alsa library to do the job. So we have APIs in Alsa library which can parse this configuration file and build it for us. The syntax of configuration file which we'll look in the future slides is basically the old UCM style. Uh, this is what uh, people used for uh, uh, UCM description. Uh, uh, for uh, main purpose to reuse the uh, UCM description was so that we don't have to rewrite a new parser in the ALSA library to the parser syntax. Uh, we already have ALSA UCM uh, parser. Uh, this is built using uh, ALSA utility tools. The ALSA utils provides a tool called topology tool. Uh, which we saw in the previous slide. So you can use a simple configuration file and uh, the topology tool to build it out. Uh, along with the whole configuration file, it allows a manifest. This is just uh, sums up what you are going to do in the configuration. Uh, drivers can use it for bookkeeping. Uh, for DSPs, apart from the description, it is pretty much important that we provide a way or mechanism for uh, drivers to know something more about uh, the particular element or particular widget you are going to do. Typically, it might be for, a, let's say, a coefficient for the particular module which you need to run at the initialization time of the module, or it may be some magic numbers which you would want to communicate with your firmware. So that is not a standard description. That is a specific uh, driver-specific or firmware or DSP-specific description. So for each element in the uh, configuration file, we also allow a private data. So for us, it has been very useful because we can describe all that what we want to do for uh, DSP and all the magic numbers which DSP needs, put that in the private data and send it down to the kernel and kernel can forward it out to the firmware. So what all information do we have in the configuration file? Uh, first, if you want to describe a particular uh, uh, configuration in the uh, for a driver, assuming we are a kernel driver for a codec, what we do is to define the controls. So similarly here, we'll also define the controls like mixer, uh, mixer control, enumerated control, or byte control. Byte control is specifically important in terms of uh, Linux, uh, in terms of DSPs, because you would typically have a uh, module which would need a bunch of parameters to be configured. So you can send some 100, 200 bytes to the particular uh, control using byte controls. And in this case, we also did something called as TLV byte control because traditionally ALSA controls have a 512 byte limitation, which we can work around by sending it as a TLV type of few kilobyte of data or more. So that is why byte controls are important here. Then we define for the particular graph the DAPM widgets, what we are going to create. And uh, to link those DAPM widgets, we have the DAPM graph associated with them. Uh, then as we saw in the previous diagram, we, in one picture we had two PCMs, in another one we had three PCMs. So we allow people to specify how many PCMs you have to use because uh, we believe that or for a system, PCM is limited just by your DMA channels probably uh, for a given system. And then people would want to have many multiple PCMs on a system or even lesser PCMs on a system. So that is kind of a software concept which should be customizable. So we provide people to specify front end or PCMs. And uh, if you are doing some processing from uh, the modem to the codec, we specify the configuration for dialings and backends. So how does the configuration look like? Uh, first, to specify a mixer control, we define it by a term section control mixer with the mixer name. Uh, mixer may be multiple multi-channel controls. So in this case, we can define the uh, multiple channels with the channel declaration. Uh, the channels can be uh, mono or stereo to be simplified. But if in case we have multiple multi-channel control, you can define front left, front right, rear, and so forth and so on. These are all ALSA standard control names. Uh, 
then uh, if we are in kernel, when we define a particular ALSA control, we, with the ALSA control, we typically define the uh, callback ops, which are basically set get and info callbacks, which are called. These callback ops can be one of the set of the standard callbacks, which are like Wallace, W, Mixer, uh, uh, Bytes, Enum, Strobe, uh, Range. Uh, we are allowed to define all this. Along with that, if you are in the kernel, what you can do is to specify one of your own driver specific callbacks. Typically, we do it in with the external keyword when we define ALSA control in the kernel. So similarly, in this case, you can define ops control. We'll have, let's say, info function as my standard uh, uh, Wallace W. But in case of get input, I want to define my own function. So you can define a value here, which will correspond to a driver specific value when the kernel loads this Control, it will try to find the value and uh, associate it with this control. So this way you can either use the standard values or your own driver specific values. The control always has an access. This specifies the how a user mode can access this control, which may be a read control, a read only access or a write only access, a read write access or a TLV access or TLV read access, TLV control access. So you can specify what the access of this control would look like. Uh, along with this, you can specify the maximum values this control can take, what, if it's an inverted control or not. If it's a TLV type of control, what is the TLV data associated with it? And for DSPs, private data. Second type of control is byte control. You can declare that with a section control bytes with a name associated with that particular control. Uh, most of the things are similar to other control, mixer control type, but you can specify along with that a byte control with a, if it's a DSP in a codec, probably you would have a, a register associated with the uh, particular codec, and then you can define the, what is the register values, what's the base, what are the number of registers, what are the mask values, and what are the maximum values this control can take. If it's an enumerated value, first we need to define a, a text section for the enum values it would need to take. So that we define using section text with the name of the enumerated values and with the set of the values. Then you define the section control enum for the enumerated control with the name of the control. The rest of the things are same, but the only difference here in this case would be the text section. Uh, in this text, if you can see, we have an EQ1 control, which is referring to the particular values you would have given. So this way you can define a control which has set of the values and the control itself. So this is all about control. Moving now to DAPM widget. Uh, a DAPM widget typically you would define in the kernel with a macro and you will pass on set of the values. These are kind of a similar things what we do here. Uh, we define a section widget uh, for a DAPM widget with the name of that particular widget. And uh, first we define what is the type of the widget. The type of widget can be AIF in, out, PGA, ADC, DAC, uh, what else, uh, PCM, uh, which is a die in, die out, input, output. Uh, these and few more are allowed uh, uh, types of widgets. So you define what is the type of the widget. If it's a stream widget type, you need to associate a stream name with it. So you can define using stream underscore name value. Uh, then the typical uh, stuff what we define in the kernel, it's the same thing here as well. So is the no PM valid or not? Uh, what is the register bit? What is the shift? What is the uh, is it inverted? Along with that, there's a control, there's a fail in ALSA control, so ALSA DAPM widget uh, called as subsequence. Not many people use it, but it's, in my opinion, it's quite useful for the DSP guys. Uh, if you have a bunch of widgets, for example, PGAs, and when you want to do a DSP sequencing, your sequencing is pretty much defined by what your firmware can do. So in this case, if firmware is enforcing some rules to for the ordering of those, for the creation and enablement of that particular widget, you can use the subsequence field within that widget type to define what comes first and what comes last. So that is where subsequence field for, at least for us, is pretty important because uh, DSPs can have different kind of sequencing requirements and you can satisfy that with this uh, value. Uh, then event type, what are the types of events uh, you would need? So if you have a DAPM widget and you want to have your own event callback for that particular widget, this is uh, the f uh, value you can use. So you can define event types in the, your driver, give them indexes one onwards, and then once the kernel loads this particular widget, it will try to map that uh, type with this value given here, 
and uh, set that particular callback for event in this in this widget. Now, uh, for the uh, callback, we also have the flags like uh, standard flags pre PMU, post PMU, pre PMD, and post PMD. So, if you want to specify the flags for which the callback should be called, we can set it here. And finally, if the DAPM widget has a mixer associated with it, like a mixer control, you can define the mixer name here. Or if it's an enumerated control associated with it, you can define the enumerated control here and in the end, the private data. So we have defined the controls. Uh, now we need to associate them controls all the into a DSP graph. So you can define that with a section graph. And as you should do in the kernel, when you have the DAPM widget sync control source, you would do the same thing here, but it's just a comma separated value. If you have no control, no need to keep null as we do in the kernel, we just leave it blank. Uh, finally, the PCMs. So PCMs in this case are of two types. One are the front-end PCMs and second are the uh, back-ends, which are basically the I2S ports. So first we define what are the capabilities of your PCM. Uh, that we define using section PCM capabilities with the name of the uh, particular capability. Uh, here we can define what are the formats this particular PCM can take, what are the channels, minimum channels and maximum channels we can have for this PCM, what are the rates we can have for this PCM. Once we have defined the capabilities as you typically would do in your driver, it's kind of analogs to that. Uh, we define what is the configuration that particular PCM is allowed to take. So so for the configuration, we have typically two things, playback and capture depending on what all you need to support. So we define that using section PCM config with the name. And then for the, it has two sets. One is the config playback and another set is the config capture. In the config playback, you define the format, rate, channel, and if you have a TDM slot, you can define the TDM slot as well. So you do this same thing for the capture. This specifies what is the configuration which is allowed to take. You can have multiple capabilities, sorry, you can have single set of capabilities for the PCM and multiple configuration. So once you have defined these two, you can define the PCM. Uh, the front end is some look, will look like something like this, which is uh, declared using section PCM. Uh, ID is the one which is used to bind it to the PCM associated in the driver. And then you can define the die name, that is the name which will appear when you create the die. And you define the playback if it supports playback. For this, we would have previously defined the capabilities. You can set the capability here for this PCM and the configs it supports. So you can have one config or you can have multiple configs depending on the use case you need. Similarly, for the capture, you would do what are the capabilities for the capture, what are the configurations required for the capture. Now, along with that, typically we sometimes need to have playback and capture in symmetric format. So you can define asymmetric rates or channels or sample bits true. If they're not true, you can set them to false. If they're true, you can set them to true and associate again a private data which your DSP can use. Uh, after PCMs, we can define die links. So die links are something like codec to codec links in the uh, DSP where you are probably getting the data from modem and sending out directly to the codec and so forth. So you can define those die links in your uh, topology as well. So that can be defined using the section link name. Uh, in this, you can have a stream name associated, that is the DAPM widget, it will be associated with it. And you can have multiple hardware configs. These are the hardware configs you will apply for that particular die link. Uh, along with the configs, uh, kernel will pick one config which will apply, which will be applied for this at, at a default that you can specify using default hardware config. Uh, then uh, the usual symmetric rate channel and sample bits, if it's true or false, you can specify. Uh, for the dialing, typically when driver uh, uh, kernel creates a dialing, it also creates ALSA control for it if you have the multiple configuration. The config one to n in this case would correspond to the enumerated values for that particular control. Uh, last, the backend I2S. So one of the, uh, the backend configuration is actually a bit different here because we don't define the backend as such. 
we define the configuration which can be applied to the backend. Uh, this is for the simple reason that your uh, front end PCMs are software driven. You can define as many as PCM as your uh, hardware limit, or if you can define only one or two based on the usage you want to do on the DSP. But your backend are actually limited by what your hardware supports. If you have only two I2S ports, you can do more than two. Uh, so it's a hardware thing. So that should be enumerated by the hardware. From you can scan how many ports you have and create your backend uh, links and backend die links. But we allow the configuration to be specified. So for example, in one particular board, you would want to run uh, it at 48 kilohertz, but on a different board, you would want to run it at uh, 96 kilohertz or 41 kilohertz. So from topology, we allow people to specify what are the formats you want to apply for that particular backend configuration. So that you can define using section die. And then for the PCM playback, you define the capabilities for the PCM capture, you define the capabilities you would like to have, uh, you would like that particular backend to have. Okay. So we have been talking about private data a little bit more details because this is kind of a little interesting for us. <laughs> so how do we define private data? So for each of the modules, you can use a section data to define private, uh, private data. It can be of multiple types. If it's, for example, a particular uh, binary coefficients for a module, let's say equalizer, you can define a file where you have all the binary coefficients that it can load and set it. Or if it's just a simple bytes, you can define a comma separated byte value or a word value or, uh, or uh, this thing, shots. Uh, along with that, what we also added is the support for tuples. So bytes, words, shots are fine, but they are not human readable. That means they are very, very hard to change. So instead of having these binary values, if my DSP needs uh, value A, B, C, and for a particular use case, I want to change those values. If I can make them human readable, it eases people's job to customize those values for them. So that is why we came up with the support um, concept of tuples. We'll explore more in the in subsequent slides. So once you have defined all the uh, private data you need for a particular uh, uh, module or a particular element, you can define section, you would have defined let's say section widget or section PCM or section uh, mixer control. Uh, for that we will have the data section in that you can specify all the private data you need. It can, it can be multiple data sections for the private data because typically if you have one data section, you can have only one type of data. So if you have a combination of stray, uh, bytes and shots, you would need, need to define first as bytes and then as wor uh, words and then add the, both of them into the data section. So what is this tuples all about? So what you can define is tokens. So it's simple uh, key value pair kind of uh, work what we have done here. You can define multiple uh, tokens, token one, two, three, and they would mean something which your driver would understand. For example, for our modules, we need to pass a UUID value. So one of the things what we do is what is the UUID of this module, which we need to send it down to the firmware and uh, we can define a UUID token for that and this is how we code it because tomorrow if somebody is integrating at the another third party module which has a different UUID, they know, oh, it's a UUID, this is how I need to replace it. So that way, instead of binary byte values or hex values, it's simple to customize for user. So how many types of uh, tokens we can have? First is a tuple string, you can define a string which you can pass to firmware or your driver. You can define a UID using tuples.uid, uh, or you can define a Boolean value with tuples.bool, or you can define bytes, simple byte values. You can have multiple tokens for different type of byte values which your DSP would understand using tuple.bytes, or again, shots or words, similar. Now we have defined the configuration file, we have defined the private data, we have defined all the widgets in the configuration file. What do we do with this configuration file? We build it. How do we build it? So as I said, Alsa Utils has a, uh, a tool available. It, uh, it's called Alsa Topology. Uh, so using the minus C option, you can give what is the configuration file for this uh, 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 particular system you want to run and with the minus O output would be whatever binary file you need to write. This binary file would eventually need to be installed in the kernel so that your driver can pick that up. 
So this particular tool uses Alsa Lib topology APIs, which were defined uh, for this uh, work. Uh, in this, uh, the Alsa topology tool basically uses SND underscore TPLG underscore build file API. It's a single API which does full job for us. Uh, it essentially takes this configuration files, passes through it, finds all the sections, finds all the data for the sections, and creates the elements for it. Uh, there are additional C, if you don't like this tool, you can write your own tool. Additional C APIs are available in Alsa library for passing. Uh, these API looks like this. So first, what you need to do is to create a new uh, topology instance. This you can do using SND underscore TPLG new. Uh, so it will define a new instance for you. And once you have the instance created for all the elements which we saw in the configuration file, you need to call SND TPLG add objects. The object may be a make control, mixer, byte, enumerated, or it may be a die, it may be a DAPM widget, it may be a map. Uh, once you have done adding all the uh, objects, if you want to have manifest block in the file, you can do that by invoking SND TPLG set manifest API. And once you are done with everything, you can ask Alsa library to build it out for you using SND TPLG build by specifying a output binary file. And at the end, you free the binary. So how does the binary look like? So binary has a header associated with it. This header persists each and every block of data we have in the binary file. First, we have a SOC as the magic number so that we know this is our binary file. And then uh, second word will be the ABI file. ABI right now is version five. Then uh, we also allow people to override and do their own stuff. Uh, if you want to do that, you can specify your own vendor version so that core will ignore it and directly pass on it to the driver. Uh, if you're not doing that, you can define it as one of the standard topology types which we were discussing like uh, uh, control, mixer, widget, tie, PCM. So that you can define as the, uh, as the topology type uh, field. Uh, after that, there's a field for header size. This is typically used to check if you have any ABI mismatches. If you are defining vendor version, you would need to have your own vendor type. So you can have use the vendor type field for that. And after that, if you, for the particular block, what is the payload you are defining? So that payload size will be there followed by index and count of this block. So this header, particular header is there for, it's not just a file header, it's a block header. So we'll have multiple blocks. So the binary file will look like something this. So you have a topology header and followed by the manifest. Manifest is always the first block because as I said, it's used for bookkeeping operations. So it makes sense to tell the driver first what, how the manifest looks like. Then uh, again, you have a header for mixer controls. You define all the mixer controls in this section together, followed by another header for enumerated controls, followed by enumerated control data, and the header for byte control, followed by the byte control data, the header for DAPM widgets, followed by DAPM widget data, uh, header for DAPM graph, followed by the DAPM graph, uh, header for the PCMs, followed by the PCMs, and die links and dies. So this is how the complete binary file look like. So we have done the whole user space thing where we define the configuration, we now have built it, now we move the gears onto the kernel side. What do we do in the kernel? So you have this binary file created, you install it in the kernel, and then uh, driver would pick it up. How does driver pick it up? Uh, we have a nice API called request firmware. So this is what we use to load the file from the user space into the kernel. So your driver would call this request firmware API. Once we have the file loaded into the kernel space, we pass it to the ASOC core using SND SOC TPLG component load. So this component load will load the uh, topology file for that particular component. The argument it expects is the first is a component. It may be a platform component, it may be a codec component, depending on your point of view. And then we give it our own topology ops. So we'll look at the ops a bit later, uh, and then you give the firmware file which you want to load. So what does this API do? The top topology component load API will start processing. You have, you have the file with bunch of headers in it followed by the block. So it will start to process the headers one by one and process the blocks based on the type it finds. First, 
check the valid header did we get bonkers or did we get garbage from the user space so we check we check for the size this helps to detect the magic uh, abi mismatches or wrong data then the magic number uh, is the magic number right is the abi version right so when we started we started with abi 1 and as i said uh, anything above abi 4 is deemed stable so till 4 it's all development versions and uh, 4 onwards we are backward compatible so if you are running 5 and you have a binary version 4 it it's supposed to work well, actually it does. And then once we had done, we load that particular header. Uh, once we have loaded the header, we will find the uh, type of the header and uh, type of the block which is following this particular header. And we will invoke a particular function which is specific to the header. Uh, so we'll look at the element loads which we have uh, in next slide. Once we have loaded all the elements, uh, that means our job is done, so we mark it as complete. Uh, if you remember uh, in driver when we define controls or when we define uh, uh, widgets we create a template for those widgets and only when the card is instantiated then only those widgets are created so similar concept is applied here in the complete if the card is instantiated we actually go and create those widgets if not we just keep the templates uh, at that point of time and once everything is done we call the topology complete it's done so what do we do in the each element load type? So in the element load type, we first is the K control element load. This is called for mixer, widget, and byte control. Uh, in this, as I said, we will typically call add K control. This is something you can uh, open code and do it in your driver or call the ALSA micro, which we have, and then call SNDSOC CNU for those particular controls. If we have a graph type of widget, that's the map, we call SNDTPLG DAPM graph element load, where we will find all the elements in the graph and start to add those DAPM RAM routes by calling SND SOC DAPM add routes. Then if we have da a widget, we will call DAPM element widget load. And uh, in this case, we will call DAPM new control. For the PCMs, we will call register the die and add those die links based on the PCM type. And as I said, if you have a backend die, we will not create the die for that because that's something done by your driver. So we will find that die find and set the stream information and the die flags for that as you would have specified in the configuration file. Same thing goes for the die link because die link is again set by your hardware or your driver. We specify the configuration. So in the topology link element load, what we do is find the die link and then set the hardware link hardware format and set the flags for this. Then uh, in the manifest type, we will just do the manifest load and tell driver this is the manifest details. Uh, in the header, we saw that there was a vendor load function and vendor type. If at all it's a vendor load or vendor load type, then in that case, we don't do any handling in the kernel for the, or in the core for that, we, the driver is supposed to do it. Uh, we don't implement it in our driver, but if you want such a flexibility or if you have a different use case, you can use this. This is also the default handler in case driver kernel doesn't recognize the type of it, and it will call the driver's load function. So how does driver specify the various load functions? Okay, hold on. Uh, before that, uh, what are the ops, topology ops the uh, control has? So when each of those widgets have been created or you are invoking DAPM to create the widget or PCM or element load for you, in that case, we all, we had the private data. So how does the private data get communicated to the driver? So for each of the object, we can specify what is the object callback. So object callback can be of type control, widget, die, link, manifest, and complete. So for each of the operation, assuming you load a control, in that case, while you are creating that control, you are in that particular control context. After the creation of the control, we will invoke driver's control callback. So that driver we know this is the particular control getting created, this is the context of this particular control, and it can go and load up its private data or save or whatever it wants to do with that particular private data. So this is the information for driver. So similar callback is given for widget, low, uh, die, link, man and manifest. Uh, uh, as, well as, as well as vendor. So uh, in the uh, previous slide, we saw that once uh, everything is done, there's a da topology complete callback. So that topology complete callback, which in turn will tell driver that, okay, I'm done processing with the whole topology. This is the end of it. So if you want to do some step at the end of it, you can use that particular hook. So how do the IO ops look like? 
So as we discussed, we have the control where we can have a standard set of IO ops and uh, uh, if you don't want to use the standard set of your set get info functions, you can use your own driver uh, function to do the job. So that uh, is declared in driver as your topology K control ops where you have the ID field. This ID field has to match with the ID you have given in the configuration file. That is how the core matches. This is the particular callback you can specify. And uh, you can actually do a mix and match. You can specify a separate uh, ID for get. You can specify a separate ID for port. You can specify a separate ID for info. Typically, it's get port would be paired and info can be separate. Or you can have a standard set for info, but you can use driver-based values for get and put. <coughs> Sorry. So this is all about topology apps. Lastly, how does the manifest block look like? We've been talking about it. This is how the manifest looks like. You have the sum of all the control elements in it. You have some of the, all the widget elements in it. You have the sum of the all graph elements, PCM elements, die link elements, die elements, and the private data. So typically we use it to allocate memory because we know we are going to get 50 controls. So let's allocate memory for 50 controls in the driver so that we can keep the driver context for it. And in the private data, we have a generic firmware specific information we need to load for our uh, DSP so that we can specify in this case here, which is not like a particular element type of information, which is a global DSP information which you want to know. So this way we make our driver more scalable and kind of little more agnostic and independent of the firmware. Yeah, in practice, a lot of things are still uh, not so great because still you have a dependency on firmware, but we try to abstract as much as possible using those values. Oops. So this was a manifest block. What is our future work? So one of the things we have today is all the configuration files which we have upstream for our projects. They are in the uh, ALSA library, which kind of gets updated once in a six months. So uh, during the Plumbers audio conference discussion, we discussed that we should uh, uh, separate it out to a separate gate, which is just a configuration file gate where all the UCM configuration and topology configurations are so that they can get frequently updated and picked up by distributions. So that work has been started. Uh, right now from the user space side, we only support ALSA library. We don't support, uh, so, uh, we don't support tiny ALSA. That is something which we need for the uh, non-PC uh, use cases to be done. Uh, so one of the things uh, we have in the widget was a particular index field. So using index field right now, everything is zero for us because we load all that at a single shot. But what we have the flexibility is to specify different set of graphs using the different set of indexes. So you can say, I want to load index one now and I want to load index two for a different use case and index three for different use case. So you can specify subgraphs, not the complete graph in one shot, but different type of subgraphs using those index values. So this work is still to be done. Okay, that's it from my side. Any questions? Yeah. So uh, to compile the configuration mm -hmm. uh, one of your outputs was PSW as a C dot Yep. Because that's just a binary file with the format we gave. But I've seen that mm -hmm. already in the firmware. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm still loading because I because it was using that before mm -hmm. So that is basically uh, for whatever you got the driver, you we have a default configuration which has a sample graph. Right. So that has been compiled into that particular binary file and that is what you are loading in your system. So if you want to customize the graph or you don't want some parts of the graph which is probably not of use for us or you want to add more things for your graph, what you can do is change the graph, compile it and install it. So as I said, like we have this request firmware. So request firmware picks up the file from standard parts like lib firmware. So you would need to again go and install that particular file in your standard directories of your distribution. So if I have, but if I have a so you, rather than starting with the binary file, you need to go back and start what is the configuration file for that particular uh, platform you're using. Yeah, it's an also lib, right.
the Skylake configuration file is already there. Okay. And this, this um, um, binary topology mm -hmm. is, is it required if my drive runs on the machine driver already has my links controls and everything defined? It will have the links, but it will not have the controls defined. So the whole graph, we don't uh, code it in the kernel. So without, if you kind of just remove the DFW file, it will, uh, it will fail to load. The driver will fail to load. Yeah. Now precisely. So if you remove the file, the driver will fail. <laughs> now you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Is there, is there an effort to create a, some sort of like a configuration utility, like a graphical configuration so you can throw me to say, oh, I want this configuration. Here's the default, here's the button that you push, mm -hmm. and then voila, there comes the configuration. This is, looks great. Then you can just add and have that output. Yeah, so that UI kind of thing, yes, we have been talking about it, but then that will be a vendor specific UI because like for Intel, we will do our own stuff which understands our graph. Some other company may they do their own. So probably there won't be a standard UI associated with Ulsa Utils, which is like for us, it's a configuration file, which is a standard. But on top of that, yes, there can be a UI and uh, I think we will have some UI in future available for people to use. You guys are nice, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, so the configuration may not be uh, different um, a lot, but then the private data where the secret source for that particular DSP lies in, that is where we need a lot of values to be configured. Sure. Mm -hmm. But it's all a standard part, yes. but the extended kind of thing. Yes. You know, kind of like novice edit, because then on a lot of configurations, sometimes it's difficult to encounter that. True. Yeah. Send a patch. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be more user space. Yeah. Yeah, I'll <laughs> Precisely. Yes. Yeah, that is like uh, what people are looking at that in runtime you define a particular uh, section of the graph and then you say, okay, load this particular thing. Yes. It's essentially for that purpose only. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes. But some of them have um, fix ups, like the call, like the optimum call for. So, fix up is nothing but your hardware configuration. So, if you remember, uh, let's go back to that slide where we specified the back end. Here. No, this is the dialing front end and next to next here. You are here defining what your physical die configuration capabilities are. So this is your fix of function implementation. Actually, you can remove that. So uh, right now in the upstream driver, we don't actually have die support. We have the all widget, uh, widget topology because we wanted the whole topology to be done first because that is where the most of the configurability is actually coming from. The PCMs were uh, the, like little later in the game, it got upstreamed in only 4.8-ish time frame. So PCM support in the driver right now is not there. It will come eventually. Yeah. Right now we don't have PCM support. PCMs need to, PCMs need to be there in the machine driver for your particular machine. Yeah, it's not supported today. But all the K, -controls. K controls, widgets, DAPM graph, DAPM, everything is there. 
apart from BCMs. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so if you are familiar with the ASOC driver, let's say simple take codec driver. So what you would do is you would have a DAPM widget section where you will define all your DAPM widgets in a table. And then you will have a map table, you will have a control table, and then when you initialize your uh, particular codec, you will register that particular codec with a core. And in that, in that, you will give it all the values in the table. So that is how those used to get loaded. And that was the only way to load, but now we can remove that hard coding from the kernel and put it under the user space and customize it. It is not useful for a lot of codec vendors because codecs are typically fixed function, so it doesn't change, but for codecs with DSP, this thing will be useful. For, in fact, for one of our uh, earlier, like, uh, midfield code, if midfield code, if you look at in the upstream, we have the whole graph coded in the kernel, and it's difficult to customize, and that's where we started looking at how we can customize it differently, because I have whole of the graph added in the kernel using the same set of declaratives where we have defined DAPM widgets, we define controls, we define the map, and then we load it always. We can't change it. So in this case, right now, we have Skylake shipping on a lot of devices, and people are doing their own customization for that. Okay, any more questions? Thank you, guys.